two years after Fallout 3, Bethesda handed over their formula to a company with Fallout 1 and 2 veterans on staff to create a hybrid that contained nothing but the best of the old and new games. The result was a post-apocalyptic adventure that strayed from Bethesda's East Coast wastelands in favor of classic Fallout's West Coast territory. More specifically, in a more sinful Sin City. What's up everyone, I'm Jacob with the Leaderboard, and it's time to fasten your Pip-Boy and pack a Stimpacker 6, or 107, because all bets are off as we count down 107 facts you should know about Fallout New Vegas. Let's get started. <laughs> Unlike Fallout 3, Fallout New Vegas was only published by Bethesda as it wasn't developed by them. It was created by Obsidian Entertainment, a studio known for games like Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic 2 and South Park The Stick of Truth. Obsidian Entertainment was founded by several former employees of a now defunct studio called Black Isle Studios, the developer behind Fallout 2. Black Isle was in the process of creating the original Fallout 3 before their project was scrapped and inherited by Bethesda several years later. Fallout New Vegas takes place in the Mojave Wasteland over 200 years after the nuclear war that created the world of Fallout. You assume the role of a courier who was shot in the head and left for dead by a mysterious thief that has taken the package you were delivering. You reawaken, rehabilitated in a ghost town called Good Springs with a mission to find out who attacked you and retrieve the package that you were tasked with delivering. Fallout New Vegas was directed by Josh Sawyer, a former Black Isle employee that was also directing that studio's take on Fallout 3 before it was cancelled. Despite directing a game set in an incarnation of Las Vegas, Josh Sawyer actually hates gambling and has personally never partaken in it. He believes it brings out the worst in our human nature and and hates how the games are always fixed in the house's favor. John Gonzalez served as the lead writer for Fallout New Vegas. He would go on to work for Guerrilla Games several years later, serving as the lead writer on Horizon Zero Dawn. Thanks to New Vegas, much of Black Isle's work on their scrapped Fallout 3 was finally used. One of the most prominent examples is the incorporation of Caesar's Legion, or Kaisar's Legion depending on who you ask, a faction originally destined for that iteration of Fallout 3. When they were in the very early stages of development, Obsidian had three creative requests for Bethesda. They wanted the game to deviate from the plot of Fallout 3, they wanted to focus on a West Coast story, specifically in Las Vegas, and finally, they wanted the story to take place between the events of Fallout 2 and 3. The third request was rejected. The development team chose to set the game in Las Vegas partially because it serves as an opposite to Washington, D.C. D.C. is home to enduring monuments and traditional American virtues, while Las Vegas appeals more to contemporary American vices with attractions that come and go every so often. While New Vegas resembles the real Las Vegas, it isn't a picture-perfect remake. New Vegas Vegas was designed around the idea of what people in the 50s expected Las Vegas would look like in the future. According to Sawyer, some of the biggest influences behind the game's style were the Mad Max films, I Am Legend, and documentary summaries from the Cold War era like The Atomic Cafe. Many of the game's cowboy elements were inspired by Sergio Leone and Clint Eastwood films of that era. The player's reputation with the factions was specifically inspired by The Man With No Name, which has a man walking into the middle of a feud that only he can determine the outcome of. In addition to further exploring the age-old Fallout theme, of War Never Changes, the creative team decided that because they set their game in a city run by gambling, the narrative of New Vegas should focus on the central theme of human greed. While the Fallout games have a tendency to demonstrate how war is ultimately destructive and pointless, the writers of New Vegas decided to do a bit of a reversal on the theme and explore darker truths, like why war could sometimes be considered necessary. The game had a rather short development cycle that only spanned 18 months. This resulted in a number of glitches and bugs that plagued the game when it launched, many of which were taken care of via post launch patches. If New Vegas feels a bit too similar to Fallout 3, it's because the game uses the same Gamebryo engine, source code, and assets as its 2008 counterpart, which certainly helped in speeding up development. While the developers didn't have much time to tinker with the Fallout 3 engine, they did make an effort to improve on the detail shown in distant objects and locations. This was important because the team thought that seeing Vegas's light pollution from the desert was an important visual element to capture. The development team took a motorcycle trip through the wilderness around Vegas to get a better feel for the open world they were building. They trekked through and took hundreds of reference photos of everything from Prim to Good Springs to the mountains of East Vegas. The audio team went on a trip into the desert about 30 miles away from civilization to capture desert noises, which was everything from digging through the dirt to causing rock slides. The audio engineers strove to achieve an authentic tumbleweed sound, so they searched the desert highway until they found the perfect specimen, which they brought back to the studio and dismantled. The artists attempted to make the western New Vegas distinct from the eastern capital wasteland of Fallout 3 by fiddling around with the game's color palette, whereas the capital wasteland 
prominently features colder, greenish-bluer colors, New Vegas utilizes warmer colors within the yellow range. According to Sawyer, the development team looked to the mods that players were creating for Fallout 3 when deciding upon new features for New Vegas. One such feature was the game's hardcore mode, which was born out of a community desire for a challenge that was more than just enhanced combat difficulty. The development team made a point to refine the gunplay of New Vegas to avoid the over-reliance on the VATS system, as was the case for many in Fallout 3. One course of action they took to achieve this was the inclusion of zoomed-in aiming. New Vegas introduced the ability to fully customize weapons with weapon mods, allowing you to add anything from scopes to extended magazines to just about any gun in order to cater to hundreds of different playstyles. Sawyer prefers giving functional names to the weapons in the games in order to avoid getting tangled in specific designations used by both manufacturers and the military. He also does it so as to not limit the capabilities of the weapon to the gun that it's based on. The game's 45 auto pistol was loosely based on the Colt M1911, a sidearm used by United States Armed Forces in both World Wars as well as the Korean War and the Vietnam War. The 45 submachine gun found in the Honest Hearts DLC is based on the real-life Thompson submachine gun, which was adopted by the U.S. military in 1938 and used in several wars, including World War II. The writers refrained from making any of the game's many factions lean toward good or evil, instead opting to make them come across more as potential rivals. This was done in order to give the player more of a choice in who they associate with without pushing them in the direction of morality. Because the game featured so many factions to interact with, the developers brought back a mechanic from Fallout 2 that was absent from Fallout 3 called Reputation. Functioning similarly to Fallout 3's Karma, New Vegas's Reputation instead focuses on a player's relationship with the game's many factions based on how they interact with them. Each faction in the game has a distinct look about them that the player can equip, and the effects they have on the player can be more than cosmetic. Depending on which faction your clothes represent, the AI will respond in a variety of ways, from praising you to shooting at you. Faction clothing also adds a stealth element to gameplay. Even if a certain faction hates your guts, you can still wear their clothes as a disguise to make infiltrating their facilities easier. The designers created the themes of all the factions around the idea of remaking the world in the image of the old world, with each faction representing a form of leadership from a different pre-apocalyptic time period. The designers toyed around with the idea of incorporating romance speech options and companion endings, but these ideas ultimately never made it off paper because writer Chris Avalon hates incorporating romance into games, finding the practice pointless. It was originally planned that if the player were to romance cast, they would both get drunk and wake up married the next morning. Another scrapped romance subplot was connected to the player's reputation. If it was high enough, the player and their companion would be married by the king, who would perform Love Me Tender much like Nick Cage in Wild at Heart. One major reason they decided to leave out the musical number was that the cost to license an Elvis Presley song for use in the game proved to be too high for their budget. The writers attempted to make failed dialogue options worthwhile for the player so as to not punish them, but to make them laugh with a humorous exchange. The Cazador was created out of Josh Sawyer's desire to incorporate a super mutated insect enemy into Fallout. He based the appearance of the creature off the look of a tarantula hawk, which is neither a tarantula nor a hawk. They're wasps. They eat tarantulas. In related news, Josh Sawyer is a monster. The word cazador is Spanish and translates to hunter in English. This is why the plural for the cazador is cazadores instead of cazadores. Early builds of the game saw an NCR super mutant ranger named Chauncey stationed at Station Foxtrot, but he was ultimately cut out of the final game. There are 65,000 lines of dialogue in the game, which is 25,000 more than Fallout 3's 40,000 lines of dialogue. Not only did New Vegas' dialogue count beat out Fallout 3, it beat out every other role-playing game available at the time, making the record all the more impressive. The game's radio DJ, Mr. New Vegas, is played by none other than famous American singer and songwriter Wayne Newton. Newton is known for being one of Las Vegas' most prominent live performers in real life, and actually does go by the nickname Mr. Las Vegas. Despite lending his voice to Fallout New Vegas, Wayne Newton admitted to never even playing a video game prior to his involvement. He claims he's had such a busy career that he's never really had the time to try them. Hollywood actor Ron Perlman returns as the game's narrator, a role that he's been committed to since the original Fallout game released in 1997. Outside of saying war never changes, Perlman is probably best known for his portrayal of Guillermo del Toro's Hellboy. Aside from Newton and Perlman, several other Hollywood personalities can be found within the game's cast, including Matthew Perry of Friends fame, Zachary Levi from Chuck, Felicia Day, known for things like The Guild, country singer Chris Christopherson, and Star Trek The Next Generation alumni Michael Dorn, also known as Lieutenant Commander Worf. Unlike Newton, Matthew Perry was actually a huge fan of the Fallout series prior to playing Benny in New Vegas. He loves the series' scale, sense of variety, and the level of interaction with the other characters. Dennis Crocker was originally intended to be a Caucasian character, but his race was changed to match that of Emerson Brooks, the actor cast to play him. On top of sharing the same engine and assets, Fallout New Vegas shared Fallout 3's composer, Inon Zur. His melodies can be heard in Dragon Age Origins, Crisis, and Soul Calibur 5. When creating the music for New Vegas, the creative team 
wanted a score that homogenized varying influences to create something different that was specific to the game. The team presented these thoughts to Zur in a single phrase, Southwest in the future. Also included within the game's score are musical pieces from the original Fallout and Fallout 2 created by the original series composer Mark Morgan. The developers thought this creative choice further enforced the idea of merging Black Isle's old Fallout with Bethesda's new Fallout. While you can partake in several forms of gambling known in the real world, the developers created a card game specifically for the game called Caravan, complete with its own set of rules. Confusing, confusing rules. In Fallout New Vegas, the Hoover Dam has become much more than a historic photo op. It's now a metaphorical pot of gold capable of producing both clean water and electricity, two elements that are in dire short supply in the Fallout world. As a result, it's constantly being contested by several factions. The looks of the mobster Benny were inspired by the real-life American mob boss Benjamin Bugsy Siegel. In addition to having a rather large resume of criminal activity, he was also crucial in the creation of the Las Vegas Strip. The enigmatic overlord of New Vegas, Mr. House, was based on Howard Hughes, a jack-of-all-trades that was everything from a businessman, investor, pilot, philanthropist, and even a film director. He was well known for being one of the most financially successful individuals of his time. Within the Mojave Wasteland lies a lone refrigerator with a skeleton sporting a nifty little gambler's hat that closely resembles an iconic movie fedora belonging to one Indiana Jones. This serves as a reference to the scene in which Indy uses a refrigerator to survive an atomic blast from literally everybody's favorite Indiana Jones film, Kingdom of the Crystal Skull. In the ravaged town of Nipton, if you have the Wild Wasteland trait, you can find the charred skeletons of a couple named Owen and Baru, a reference to the fate of Luke Skywalker's Uncle Owen and Aunt Baru in Star Wars Episode IV, A New Hope. While wandering the wasteland, there's a possibility that you may run into a gang of old ladies brandishing murder weapons that they utilize to fulfill their lust for your blood. They're a nod to the Monty Python sketch called Hell's Grannies, which focuses on a group of grannies that randomly attack people. Within the Searchlight Church basement lies another reference to Monty Python, where you can find a crate of holy frag grenades, a callback to the blessed weapon from Monty Python and the Holy Grail. But from our findings, there are no killer rabbits to use these on. If you have the Wild Wasteland perk activated and are in Cottonwood Cove, you can find graffiti on the side of a building that reads Romanes Eunt Domus, which is yet another reference to Monty Python, specifically the film Life of Brian, in which Brian unsuccessfully attempts to write Romans go home in Latin onto a building, and then he gets punished in the worst way possible, a grammar lesson. If you have the Wild Wasteland trait and visit the X8 Research Center in the Old World Blues DLC, you'll find a group of cyber dogs sitting at a table playing poker. This is a reference to the famous series of paintings by C.M. Coolidge of dogs playing poker. The architecture within the game was based on the designs found in Las Vegas in the 1950s, as well as the first settlements ever established on the west coast of the United States. Unlike all other locations visited in the Fallout series, the Las Vegas Strip is one of the few that was not hit by nuclear weapons during the war. In Vault 21, a picture of a man and a woman can be found next to Sarah's bed. These are actually the parents of the Fallout 3 protagonist, the Lone Wanderer. The Child at Heart perk, which improves your interactions with children, can be found within the files of Fallout New Vegas, though it goes unused in the final game, possibly because there are very few children within the game. Though the game's files feature a texture with a higher resolution for the spiked knuckles, the model for the ones used by the player doesn't utilize it. Within the game's files is a Rambo-like image of Vault Boy labeled Perk Survivalist. It differs from the survivalist perk found in Fallout 1 and 2, but it's unknown what this iteration of the perk would have done. A challenge within the game titled A Slave Obeys requires the player to kill Mr. House with Nephi's golf driver or the nine iron. This, spoilers, is a reference to a scene in Bioshock, spoilers, in which the protagonist Jack beats Andrew Ryan to death with a golf club after being told by Ryan that a man chooses, a slave obeys. Due to an error within the game's statistics and code, the perk in Shining Armor doesn't actually do anything. It was meant to give the player an additional plus five damage threshold against energy weapons while wearing any metal armor and plus two while wearing reflective eyewear, but that is not how it turned out. The propaganda posters put out by the NCR are referencing a style of propaganda poster that was prevalent during World Wars 1 and 2. The Fat Man and its mod Little Boy are named after the two atomic bombs that the United States dropped on the Japanese cities of Nagasaki and Hiroshima during World War II. The Japanese version renames the Fat Man to the Nuka Launcher, but the Little Boy's name goes unchanged. The game features cereal boxes labeled Sugar Bombs, a reference to the popular comic strip Calvin and Hobbes, in which chocolate-frosted sugar bombs are Calvin's favorite breakfast cereal. It is possible to be banned from the casinos for doing too well. This was done to prevent players from gaming the game, especially in a world where luck itself is a stat that can be boosted. However, getting banned isn't all glum. If you manage to get banned from every casino on the strip, you'll be awarded with the Courier Who Broke the Bank achievement, worth 30 gamer score on Xbox and a silver trophy on PlayStation. The soldiers of Caesar's Legion receive certain types of weapons based on their rank. Recruits are limited to using spears and machetes and are only able to wield firearms if they rank up to veteran status. The armor worn by 
by Caesar's Legion is actually old sports equipment from the University of Arizona and poorly repurposed for combat. The developers regret not making the Legion a more appealing option for the player to follow. For one, they were aware of how sexist and cruel the faction was and how little independent content they were given, especially when a lot of their appearances happen fighting against the NCR. Within the game are two major radio stations, both committed to a certain genre. One is all country all the time, and the other features licensed hits from the 40s and 50s. Can't go wandering around the post-apocalyptic West without Marty Robbins' big iron blasting on your pip boy. If you use console commands during the ending slideshow, you can find a character named Ron the Narrator, who is used to narrate the game's slides. He's named and modeled after his voice actor, Ron Perlman. Within the game's files are a series of unused Mr. New Vegas radio reports detailing the outcome of each achievable ending. These were likely cut due to the fact that the player cannot continue the game after finishing the story due to the drastic consequences. In the official Fallout New Vegas editor, the GEC, short for the Garden of Eden Creation Kit, the object effect for the flare gun is labeled Burn and Nate All the Peoples, a line from the HomestarRunner.com song Trogdor, sung by Strong Bad. Jacobstown is run by a mutant named Marcus, the mutant companion from Fallout 2. He's even still voiced by actor Michael Dorn. Jacobstown features yet another callback to Fallout 2 with the returning character Dr. Henry, who previously resided in the New California Republic. In Fallout 2, he was working on a serum that would cure super mutants, while in New Vegas, he's working to cure the Nightkin schizophrenia. Companion Rose of Sharon Cassidy is the daughter of one of Fallout 2's companions, John Cassidy, who up and left his daughter at a young age to wander the wastelands. If the Wild Wasteland trade is equipped and you head over to the construction site ridden with large red crystals, you'll find seven tiny gnomes with pickaxes and lanterns surrounding the crystals, a reference to the story of Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. In the Lonesome Road DLC's Cave of Abandon, you may find a preserved fossilized dog standing next to a skeleton named Seymour. This is a reference to the Futurama episode Jurassic Bark, in which Fry finds his dog Seymour, who has now been fossilized. One of the scrapped ideas for DLC involved the player partaking in an Ocean's Eleven type heist of the entire Vegas Strip, but this was scrapped on the grounds that this type of gameplay wasn't true to Fallout. The idea eventually evolved into the basis for the Dead Money DLC. The Zion Canyon, featured in the Honest Hearts DLC, is based on the real-life Zion National Park, which happens to be a favorite vacationing spot of the game's director, Josh Sawyer. Lonesome Road's main antagonist, Ulysses, was originally intended to be a companion for the player in early builds of the game. He would have been sympathetic towards the Legion. The Lonesome Road DLC was built around the final image of the original Fallout, the Vault Dweller wandering off into a lonely future. Only instead of looking toward a lonely future, he's heading into the past to see what those events have done in the present. The core idea behind the Old World Blues DLC was the optimistic atomic future of what might have been, and the idea that all of the world's technological marvels could have saved the world if the men behind them were better. The Dead Money DLC was based around the themes of greed and human nature. To hit the point home, they designed the gameplay to feel like something akin to a survival horror game, something that would make using a stim pack feel amazing again. Dead Money is the only DLC that cannot be revisited upon completing its main quest. One of the goals of the Honest Hearts DLC was to take a serious look at real world religion in a video game, a theme that is often mocked by the medium as a joke. More specifically, it's about how different people view similar beliefs and where the disconnect between those beliefs are. At the start of the game, the player is given a mental health test in the form of ink blots, one of which to many fans appeared to resemble two bears high-fiving, but it wasn't an option for some reason. Thankfully, a fan created a mod which added two bears high-fiving as an option, which in turn led to Obsidian creating a character named two bears high-fiving for the Honest Hearts DLC. If the player has the Wild Wasteland trait equipped in the Lonesome Road DLC and nukes both Caesar's Legion and the NCR, the ending slide will resemble the ending scene from Planet of the Apes. During the Dead Money DLC, the player can find a bit of graffiti in the wine cellar near the bell tower that reads, I am not your mummy, which is a reference to the two-part Doctor Who episode, The Empty Child, and The Doctor Dances. Fallout New Vegas was initially announced at Bethesda's London Showcase in April of 2009. Additional details were not provided until the 2010 issue of PC Gamer, 10 months later. Fallout New Vegas was released for PC, Xbox 360, and PlayStation 3 on October 19th, 2010 in the United States. The European release came three days after, on October 22nd of 2010. By November of 2010, the game had shipped over 5 million units and raked in over $300 million in revenue. By 2015, the game had sold an estimated 11.6 million copies. If players pre-ordered New Vegas from Kmart, they would receive four drink coasters representing the four major casinos found within New Vegas, the Ultra Lux, Vault 21, the Tops, and the Lucky 38. New Vegas was received very well critically, with the PC and Xbox versions scoring 84s while the PS3 version scored just a tad lower with a score of 82. Despite the good meta score, the 84 lost Obsidian possible royalties from Bethesda, who promised them royalties beyond their initial payment only if their game achieved an 85 or higher meta score, literally one point above what the game earned. The game experienced even 
even more performance issues on the PlayStation 3 version, but this was due to the fact that the PS3 divides its 512 megs of RAM between graphics and memory, while the Xbox 360 can allocate its full 512 megs of RAM for both. As a result, the longer a player plays the PS3 version, the bigger the file size gets, and the bigger it gets, the more difficult it becomes to run. While Bethesda and Obsidian patched up many of the game's post-launch problems, they couldn't fix them all. Fortunately, members of the New Vegas community stepped up to the plate and created their own fan patches that fixed bugs that the professionals couldn't. Well after the game launched, director Josh Sawyer created his own unofficial mod for New Vegas that added features that he wanted for the official release but were turned down. These changes include adjusting the max level cap to 35, decreasing the rate at which a player earns XP, reducing base health and the amount of weight one can carry, and defining a player as good or evil instead of neutral. Josh Sawyer has stated that he would love to work on a sequel to New Vegas if he were given the chance. He would want the game to take place in a location adjacent to the Mojave Wasteland, claiming there are a lot of cool places around there. And there you have it. Once again, I'm Jacob, and thanks for watching 107 Facts about Fallout New Vegas. What's your favorite moment in the game? Did we miss anything? Comment below and let us know. Don't forget to click the bell icon to become part of our notification squad, and if you like getting more from your games, subscribe to the leaderboard. Your home for video game facts.